second and final day of public conference. Um, and I'm here today to introduce David Nally. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with David and his work, but he uses his ham call sign on Twitter if you're looking for it. It's KE4QQQ, for those of you who are into that. Um, he is a Fedora contributor and also a recovering sysadmin. He now works for CloudStack, um, and he's here today to talk about ops in the cloud. So, welcome. Thank you. Um, so, just to elaborate on that, um, tell you a little bit about who I am. I suck at making slides pretty, uh, and so you will see my, my uh, slides, which are essentially text on a white background. Uh, there's nothing pretty about them. I'm a recovering sysadmin. I was a sysadmin for about a decade um, and then got uh, started working in uh, open source and I still remember down, not across, but uh, there are things that I can tell that I'm forgetting. Um, I'm the community manager for CloudStack, which is an infrastructure as a service uh, cloud platform that's open source uh, and I contribute to some other uh, open source projects. Um, I'm also told that I'm a bit, uh, I tend to be a bit pessimistic, and you will see that come out in this talk. Um, as, an, as someone who's been doing ops for, for about a decade, the, the idea of some of the things that are being pushed uh, as being awesome because they're cloud and the problems that they're talking about solving with the cloud um, in some ways anger me, in some ways frustrate me, and you'll see a lot of that come out. So. This talk is not a number of things. Um, it's not going to tell you how to be the next Facebook or the next Zynga. Um, those types of companies have special problems, and they're almost one-offs, right? Um, when you're deploying 30,000 nodes, 30,000 physical nodes, um, you've got a different set of problems than, than probably 98, 99% of companies out there. Um, as a matter of fact, this probably isn't going to tell you uh, the magical solution for, for anything. Um, this also isn't a uh, product talk. Uh, so I think CloudStack's the best uh, infrastructure as a service platform. I hope that everyone uses it, um, and I won't talk about it at all today. Um, and you won't get a checklist out of this. Um, I will not provide you the magic plan to succeed uh, with ops in the cloud. I will tell you a lot of the pitfalls that I see. So we have this problem. Um, if you've been approached by a cloud vendor, regardless of the type of cloud that they're pushing on you, um, you will know that clouds will give you everything that you ever wanted. They will solve all of your problems. And as a bonus, you will get a, either a unicorn or a pony, uh, completely your preference. Uh, and there's a lot of ignoring some of the uh, underlying fundamental problems that come with the cloud. And really, uh, most of the people who try and, and take advantage of cloud strategies, they honestly, they end up failing. And they end up failing because they don't have a lot of the prerequisites. They haven't figured out configuration management. They haven't even figured out automated provisioning yet. Um, they haven't figured out how to monitor very well. Uh, the number of places that still rely on users uh, is staggering. And then they are told, hey, this cloud thing, don't have to worry about downtime. We'll automatically, uh, automatically bring that back up. Uh, so that's a, uh, you know, a lot of these places see the cloud as their salvation, uh, and, and it certainly is not. Um, so, so when you're, when you're thinking about uh, taking a company that actually does have these things figured out, they have the automated provisioning, they have the orchestration and the monitoring and the configuration management already solved for their limited uh, domain, uh, and you think about putting them in the cloud, uh, and I'm hoping that that's most of the people here, uh, and here's why. Um, you're at PuppetConf. Uh, Hopefully that's a self-selecting crew that, that has operations at least quasi figured out. Uh, you at least know where you need to go if, uh, if not already doing it. So you have these problems of um, you don't have the same access 
to the same types of things in the cloud, particularly if you're using a public cloud. If you're using Amazon, you have no access to, uh, to Pixie Boot a machine. Uh, one of the repeated questions that I get from people who are, who are pretty squared away is, but I wanted to use Cobbler to provision my, my instances. Um, you can't Pixie Boot, and, and honestly, most of the cloud platforms that are private clouds won't allow you to Pixie Boot. Um, so you don't have some of that same access. You also don't have, uh, don't have the same life cycle. Uh, you know, even with traditional virtualization, the life cycle can be significantly longer for a virtual machine than, than what, uh, what people are experiencing in the cloud. If you're using things like auto scaling, a machine can come up and go down 30 minutes. A machine may have a complete life cycle of 30 minutes. Um, and people aren't set up to deal with that. Things are happening incredibly fast. Uh, and, and things are really decentralized as well. So it may have been your monitoring system that made the decision to provision and then decommission a machine. Um, and uh, nothing was, no human was involved at all. So I, I generally tell people, and this is one of my rants about uh, you know, we pitched cloud as being this ambiguous solution to everything. If you don't have these four things figured out, and particularly uh, have yourself squared away with, with regards to these four elements, which are automated provisioning, config management, orchestration, and monitoring, you're not ready for the cloud. If you do have them figured out, you still have lots of work to do. Um, so. Most of the people who are, do, who are provisioning in the cloud, um, they have at least some level of automation, but that level of automation is templates. And I think that templates are a complete fail. Um, there's template sprawl that you have to deal with. There's the fact that these uh, templates tend to get old and crufty after a while. And we've been using things like Pixie Boot or Cobbler or FAI for, uh, for a number of years in a traditional ops setting, and then we go backwards with things like Golden Masters. Um, you, don't, you don't tend to have access to Pixie Boot machines, and so we're in many ways still trying to figure out how to do that. And then, you know, even if you have this master template, are you producing AMIs, VHDs, OVAs, QCAL2, BMDK? What disk format are you actually using? Um, because some of the most successful clouds out there are not single hypervisor. Uh, so it's not necessarily just VMware or just Zen Server or KVM. Um, and so you have a disk image. How do you make sure it starts? Um, I think there's some, some groundbreaking work with, uh, with a project called Box Grinder. And uh, they have this idea of taking a kickstart or taking a template, um, a te a def template definition and provisioning a disk image in real time as you request it, converting it to the type of uh, disk image that you want, and then actually pushing that out to your cloud provider. Uh, much like you would have done with a cobbler, where you would have taken that kickstart, um, you would have, uh, have pixie booted an image they're skipping the pixie boot and uh, just writing the disk image. So, so also, if you're, if you're truly designing things right, you're not doing single provider. You're not only using Amazon, or you're not only using uh, uh, Rackspace as your cloud provider. You're going to have multiple cloud providers. How do you mix and match your content across here if you're auto-provisioning? How do you even make the decision about where your content goes. Um, I think those are some, some hard problems that haven't yet been figured out. You have, uh, you have people like uh, JClouds who are figuring out that you don't really want to, to interact with lots of different APIs and providing you a single API to do some of those things. But uh, you know, people are having a hard enough time getting their head wrapped around um, the fact that they don't have Pixie booting and they're having to use a template that may have been, you know, an AMI that was created by someone else. Uh, 
Can they trust it? Does it have a root kit? Um, there are a number of potential problems there uh, that, uh, that are difficult to, to deal with. So with config management, um, you know, it, historically, whether it's Puppet or Chef, you have things like nodes.pp that you go in and you define a node and you say, here's what we're going to, to uh, set up as far as uh, manifests that are going to be included on this, uh, on this host. That doesn't scale very well and that also doesn't, uh, that doesn't work when you're having things automatically provisioned for you. Um, so the first question is, I'm going to have something magically spin up host. How do I ensure that it gets the correct manifest? I can't have a host spin up and, you know, if I need it to be an extra app server, I can't have it sitting there waiting on someone to come in and, and add it to nodes.pp or, or, uh, or something of that nature. So, you know, some of the globbing is an option. Some of, the, of uh, defining that with your, um, with whatever is automating your provisioning um, is, uh, is a good idea. And then we get to that entire idea of, do I really want to auto sign every machine that makes a request? Um, this is a puppet conference, so do I want to turn on auto signing? Um, you also then have the problem of, wow, you know, I've, I've provisioned and decommissioned 50,000 machines and I now have I now have all of these um, certificates laying around on the master. Do I really want to keep a backup of that? Um, so, you know, this entire idea of getting these machines that may have a very short life cycle into config management and then decommissioning them is, uh, is a significant challenge. You also have the problem of do you have a lot of cruft, right? Um, if you're automatically adding things to files like nodes.pp, uh, when do you take it away? Does your decommissioning handle that? Um, all of that cruft is a, is a significant problem. And I think that's a significant problem. You have places that are, you know, actively provisioning. Uh, I think uh, Amazon said some of their largest customers are provisioning and decommissioning up to 10,000 servers a day. What's that going to do to to the um, to the performance on your CA uh, server for, uh, for Puppet. So I think there are some significant challenges that you really have to figure out because this isn't, uh, this isn't I ordered a box from, from HP or Dell. It took two weeks to get here. I'm going to spend a week uh, installing it. I'll use my automated provisioning and get everything set up and allocate all of those IP addresses. This is it took, takes me 18 seconds to get a running instance. Now what do I do with it? Uh, so I think monitoring is, is the biggest deficient area with the cloud right now. Um, I think there are some solutions at least in progress for some of the other problems. I don't think monitoring is one of them. We have historically taken this centralized, you know, we'll dump syslog to Splunk, we'll, uh, we'll dump uh, all of our uh, SNMP to a Xenos or a Cacti, uh, we'll do status checks with Nagios. If you're deploying, you know, 50 machines, are you really going to restart Nagios every single time you need to, to add a machine to a definition? Um, and how do, you, how do you then ensure that, uh, that Nagios doesn't, doesn't uh, become a problem uh, with a lot of cruft? On top of that, how do you know when a machine goes down? First of all, do you care, right? So if you're operating at any scale and a single instance goes down, is that a really a problem? Um, do you really want to be woken up about that? Uh, so are you doing service monitoring? At, at what level is that what you're doing as opposed to, to monitoring instances, which has traditionally been what people monitor? You also, though, have this idea that, um, that you know, this machine's going to go away. The life cycle's changed. How do you decommission monitoring? 
if the machine went away, is that something to alert on or is that just something that the, the uh, whatever automation actually took it away? Um, or is it the cloud doing some high availability function and, and moving the machine and it went away for a few minutes? Finally, I, I think there's a problem with all of this data. So if I provision a machine and, and we'll give it an IP address of uh, 4.4.4.4, if I have this virtual machine come up, I'm logging it, it's a database server, it's doing wonderful things for me, and now I no longer need it. Do I purge those logs? Can you do that if you're in a regulated environment? Um, probably not. What about, uh, what about taking that data and, and storing it? How do you associate that? Because two weeks later, that same IP address may be given out to an app server. Different type of logs, uh, different things that you're going to want to monitor, different performance metrics. And I think that you're going to have some, some issues around, you know, okay, I need to see what happened two weeks ago on my app servers. Where are the logs for all the app servers? Uh, because historically, that IP address has been the type of aggregation that we're, that we're uh, filtering things on. We know that that this set of IP addresses, because we've defined it as such, is our app server. Uh, and with transient, with transient machines, even with things like aggregation to syslog in G or to, uh, to Splunk, you still have a big problem of how do I know what data is pertinent and how, do I, how am I able to filter it and uh, when do I purge it? Because the machine lifecycle is very different. So finally, I think there's, there's problems with orchestration. And I think that, uh, I think we're starting to see some, some moves in here. Uh, you know, Rundeck, Capistrano, Funk, uh, M Collective are all trying to solve some of the pieces of this orchestration, uh, the orchestration problem that you get with the cloud. But, you know, if you're, if you're orchestrating, how do you know how many app servers there are at any one time? Do you do that by name? Uh, do you have some other way of aggregating all of, those, uh, all of those app servers so that you can start a job? If you're doing, if you're doing uh, high performance computing, and how do you know how many actual compute nodes you have up at any one time? And how does your orchestration piece know how many nodes you have up at any one time? Um, those are some of the, the significant problems that people tend to have and tend to experience uh, when, they're, when they're starting to play with, with pushing these things out to the cloud, right? Um, you know, if you, if you push an app deployment out to your app servers, what if you miss half of them because you didn't know they existed? Um, so it, part of this is, is hopefully a conversation starter. And I really want to, to make this uh, very interactive. So you've listened to me run my mouth for about 20 minutes. Um, what do you think? Am I crazy? Uh, does the cloud really solve all your problems? Are there unicorns and ponies sitting outside the, the venue here? Um, because no one has shipped me mine yet. And I'm upset at, that I was promised wonderful things and didn't get anything. No one. No one's upset about not getting their penny either. Okay. Um, yes, sir. Okay. I think, so I think, I think it doesn't solve all your problems. It just shifts. It just shifts what problems you, you you have and you have to deal with. And hopefully there are better tools other than skilled people and time to solve them. You know, I, I think that uh, I think that that's probably true. I think it's a shift. I think, though, that that the people who are doing some of that shifting don't realize the scope of the domain. Um, I think when when people like Amazon came up with AWS, fabulous idea for that limited domain. But then it got pitched as, "Wow, this is cloudy. It'll solve your problems," and I don't think that past the limited domain of Amazon, for instance, that they understood 
well, you know, we've got some complex interactions that actually have to occur here. Um, so I see people who, you know, think the cloud's wonderful and they provision a single web server. Um, and I guess it's okay for that. I don't know that it's much better than, than some of the things that were there before. I think the problem is, is that, you know, we've got an ops mentality here that is dramatically changing, uh, particularly if you look at some of the DevOps movement. I think that uh, I think that's a dramatic shift. The idea of pushing something to deployment multiple times a day. Eight years ago, I would have told you you're crazy. I would have pushed for you to get fired if you wanted to push eight application updates in a single day. There are places who are doing that, you know, eight times an hour uh, in uh, in the real world now. You should hear what our QA people have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I'm even pushing back now. Uh, for for some of the things that are being pushed as far as applications, for uh, uh, you know that have been around for a week or two, that the old ops side of me says, "Whoa, that's too fast." Uh, I understand the DevOps philosophy. I s largely agree with it, but I think the vast majority of of the uh, of the true IT world has no concept. And so this idea of, of doing things in the cloud, being able to innovate very rapidly uh, and succeed and fail rapidly is lost on them. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, we have this, uh, someone described it as an echo chamber. We have this echo chamber where people who get config management, who get automated provisioning, who get that DevOps philosophy, they all talk to each other and we feed off of that and we forget that the rest of the world has no concept of, of doing things that way. There's also a huge disconnect between what the technical people see as the cloud and what the business people see as the cloud. Right. And no what, what do you think the business people see the cloud as? Because I'm curious. I, I'm it, clearly it's, not a business person. It's snake person. oil. I mean, I, I, I work in an environment where we started with a huge data center located out of Colorado. And there, Salespeople are, are, are selling this stuff all over the globe. And at this point now we have uh, cloud data centers in Amsterdam, London, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Sydney, Auckland, Florida. You, the networking and latency issues. And now we've got configuration nightmares. And now if a customer's running, you know, applications through Hong Kong, uh, gee whiz, they have to actually hit a Postgres database back in Denver. Right. That's just crazy. Yeah, so I, I largely think that some of, the, some of the features of the cloud haven't yet been explored. And I think that that's, uh, uh, I think that first of all, there's very poor understanding largely. And I think that's partly the industry's problem for so ambiguating. Uh, it's a moving target. I, I don't think I, I think that that people are going to sell you whatever they have to offer and market it as cloud. Um, I am I am sad to report I am I am sad to report that uh, the cloud sandwiches that are going to be available for lunch are not going to be here. I was going to to offer to sell you some some cloud sandwiches at a slight premium over what you could get normal sandwiches, right? That's but, like buying an air guitar. Exactly, and and I think that. Uh, I think that that is uh, both an industry failing, being cloud washing essentially everything. Uh, but there's also, um, even for the hardcore, hardcore stuff that really is cloud, you know, the, the um, cloud foundry, the uh, infrastructure as a service projects that are out there, I don't think that they, um, I don't think that they're well understood. I don't think that they make themselves well understood. Um, my biggest complaint when I started with, uh, with my current employer is we do a horrendous job of telling people what we do. Uh, I've told another cloudy group whose name I won't mention because I think they do awesome stuff. Uh, I've told them you should never tell people what you do because you can't do it. Uh, I sat down with you at dinner and I listened to your elevator pitch and then I listened to your 15 minute pitch and I had no idea what you did at the end of the conversation. It's not about solving the technical problems. It's about 
how you can part the customers from their cash, what the salespeople can sell, and things like this more than, than the technology. I, I think it in some ways is a technology problem though as well because I don't think that the people who truly understand it can explain it. And I think that uh, I think that until you reach the point where you can tell people what you actually do that, that uh, you're still going to have this problem. Anyone else want to argue or dispute with me? Anyone else want to agree with me? I actually have a question. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll let him go first, though. You were the first to the microphone. <laughs> so I've been dabbling with the cloud for the last year or so. Mm -hmm. And what I'm, you know, the devil's always in the details. Sure. Every cloud provider provides something different. They have different feature sets. I see it as my job of understanding all the new things that are available and how to fit that into what I can use. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily using all the cool features that are available. Um, and so it's just a giant learning process. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I, I think there's a podcast of this. You know, the, there's people like uh, John Willis who are, who are telling people you should be asking the why. Uh, why do you want to do cloud? And people say, well, you know, we want to we want to provision machines. We want that provisioning time to shrink from eight weeks to, to eight minutes. Well, why do you want to do that? Um, I, I think uh, I do think, and this sounds strange coming from a person who has a cloud.com email address, but I do think that the vast majority of people aren't ready and don't have a current use for for the cloud. Um, right, because what we do right now is we put a lot of disparate services on the same hosts, mm -hmm. just so that we don't spin up too many hosts that are mostly idle. Right. So we have some dedicated service, we have some cloud instances. And I think the, the trick for us is to figure out when do we need elastic features and when do we not. Yes. And th there seems to be, I haven't found any tools that will let me allocate services to existing hosts based on available capacity, for instance. Yeah, you're right. I, I don't think that exists yet. Um, so that's sort of the I, opposite I think the, problem of what most people are. I, I think most providers are actually pushing people away from that, though, because they want you to provision more instances, because that's more memory you're consuming, that's more disk space you're consuming, i.e., that's more money that they're getting you to part with, even if they're, quote, unquote, saving you money in the process. Um, uh, you know, I think that uh, I think that you're going to. I fear a little bit of a backlash. I fear that the industry is going to say, you know, this was the uh, the dot com boom of 2000, 2001, and you know, while while the internet is a great place, and certainly the dot com boom made it interesting. We, uh, we're going to back off a little bit. And, and things like this will still be important, but you know, you're going to have a, a stigma attached to it. Uh, just finally, I think it's quite telling that some of the biggest players, they use the, the public clouds just temporarily while they figure out if their new product is successful or not. And then as soon as they know what the load is, mm -hmm. they take it back home. Uh, so I think it's. Um, I think if you look at the people who do it, Martin was talking about uh, Plinga, and there are certainly other people who are doing things similar. This hybrid cloud um, approach, the people who are doing it for monetary reasons, they're pushing, uh, they're pushing their new products out into the public cloud. They figure out what the load is. Then they bring up a private cloud because they want to keep those machines running all the time, and then they're just sending their excess stuff, the stuff, the surges, temporary surges. So you know, if if um, you know, uh, tablets.com wants to sell $50 touch pads, they advertise the touch pads. They expand that out of their private cloud to to uh, to the public cloud just to handle the the uh, effect of advertising $50 touch pads. It's going to add to their load. Um, 
there have been a number of studies that say that if you keep it internally, you can still do it cheaper if you're actually consuming all the resources of the, of the hardware and, and uh, infrastructure that you have internally. You can still do that cheaper than you can by pushing it to the cloud. The problem is you can't scale that rapidly, cheaply. You have to have so much excess capacity to be able to scale. And that's one of the things that the public cloud does, will give you. What's your question, Selena? <laughs> I have two now. OK. Um, so do you think that there, there's now there's services that will allow you to kind of look at your costs mm -hmm. amongst multiple cloud providers? Um, and do you think that those types of services will maybe drive some standardization of services so you can actually figure out what it is that you're paying for? That's my first question. And then my second one is about this issue of trying to use up available resources. Um, that seems like a, like a space for some open source tools to kind of invade. There's a couple of things that I'm aware of, like Gearman, that mm -hmm. kind of start edging into that territory, but they're certainly not quite ready to do the types of things that people would really need to do. So anyway, those are my two. So I think this entire idea, there are, there are a number of uh, startups out there that are doing this entire idea of uh, cloud instances. You know, you have, you have a federated cloud that, you know, I'm running 50 machines and I will give you this amount of compute power for, for this price because I'm not using it right now and essentially creating a cloud exchange where you can come and here's what I have to offer. You can buy it if you want. It's excess capacity to me. Uh, I just, I'm, it's a sunk cost, right? So, so I'm going to be paying for it regardless. If you want, uh, if you want capacity, I think that, uh, uh, that you can come and bid on it and you know, I may accept your bid or I may not and then you run your, your application. I think I think that is fine for certain workloads. I think that uh, I, I think that you know we still are living in an age where the EC2 and the S3 APIs are the de facto standards, and um, you know Yuka implements those, uh, CloudStack implements those, OpenStack implements those. Um, even Gluster and a couple of other places that aren't your traditional cloud providers are implementing those Amazon APIs. I think, I think that has become the standard, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Um, uh, you know, with, uh, with some of the rates that Amazon is claiming that they're provisioning machines at, they're still the dominant player. And until that changes, I don't think there's going to be a move away from that API. I think that's as standardized as we're going to get. Um, I think that m maybe if one of those um, cloud exchanges and, and in the idea of a federated cloud where you can make available in a secure way uh, compute power from your cloud uh, takes off, I think that uh, I think maybe we'll see, uh, we'll see some additional movement there. I don't think providers want to get into a bidding war amongst themselves. I do not expect. I do not expect an exchange to come up and for people to get into a price war between Rackspace and Amazon and GoDaddy. I don't think that's going to happen. I think, uh, I think instead you'll, you'll see private clouds maybe doing that. Um, it's in none of the provider's interest to get into a bidding war. That answer both of your questions? I think so. Okay. I guess I guess I'm I'm kind of interested in any spaces where um, open source community projects can start helping solve some of these problems because I I've heard this uh, complaint before of okay I've got these systems that I'm setting up because I know that you know I, I may need that capacity there at mm -hmm. some point. But meanwhile, it's just kind of sitting there idle, and maybe I could do some batch processing for something else there right now. So there's just like that that idea of being able to do that yourself mm -hmm. instead of, you know, setting up some bidding thing. You know, you, yeah, basically being able to do that type of thing yourself instead of. So there are some active open source projects and quasi open source projects out there. Um, 
the one that jumps to mind immediately, and it's because it's relatively close to home, is called MyCloud, which is a collaboration with RightScale. Um, but the technology is all open source, so it could be replicated by anyone. And effectively, RightScale says, go provision your machines with this live CD, and then you can either use it or you can, you can offer up that capacity to others. RightScale is the only person who's done it, and I don't know anybody who's actually taking advantage of the fact that they've, they're federated and allowing people other than themselves. I think that's still very scary. Uh, um, you know, what, what if somebody jumps a ring in virtualization and, and controls the hypervisor or, or is able to jump to another virtual machine? I think that still scares a lot of people. Um, maybe we'll see research places doing it at some point. I, I, don't see, uh, I don't see industry doing it at the moment. Anything else? We've got uh, just a few minutes left. All right, well, uh, again, my name's David Nally. Um, I'll give you my email address. It's david at cloudstack.org. You can follow me on Twitter at KE4QQQ. I appreciate you coming. It, feel free to find me in the hallway, talk to me, or shoot me an email. I'm also on IRC as KE4QQQ. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll get started again at 11. So there should be coffee upstairs if you need any. <laughs>